welcome the both of you to another stirring, uplifting service here at the congregation. Whether we are few or many, the presence of the living God is here amongst us. And I also want to welcome those joining in live stream because, you know, on good information, the spirit of the living God is going to be where you are in your living room, wherever you are taking in this service. But we are coming together to honor the King, the Lord, Messiah, Yeshua. We are joyful company as we get together as we do for this is Shabbat and we know the king we know the king of Israel blessed be he and so I welcome you to this service at Buffalo's only and therefore finest messianic synagogue we are comprised of Jewish and non-Jewish people who've come to believe that Jesus Yeshua is the Messiah of our people some may think that we've believe the way we do because we're a little Meshuggah. But I want to tell you, we have all of our faculties together. We have examined history. We have examined the writings of our fathers. And we come to the conclusion with great confidence and with great zeal that this is the Messiah. And the Messiah of Israel sends to us his comforter, the spirit of the living God, and they are present in this sanctuary right here, right now, as well as the Messiah and his spirit dwell within our hearts. And so with great excitement, we open up our time together, and I trust that by the move of God upon your heart today, that you are going to have a sense of excitement that whatever you may be going through, that nothing is impossible with the Lord. May he draw close to you. May he draw close to each and every one of us. Amen? This, this is our desire. Now, there is something that it, within this day's Parsha that I want to read to you. It's a sad account, but it's ever so relevant. Not that I want to be sad. And it comes from Numbers 32. Then they said, these are the tribes of Gad and Reuben. If we have found favor in your eyes, let this territory be given to your servants as a possession. Don't make us cross the Jordan. And what I want to bring out is this. At long last, our people are entering into the land of promise. But two of our tribes, Reuben and Gad, saw that the land on the other side of the Jordan was very green, was very plush. And they plead with Moses, don't let us cross with the Jordan, let us to stay here. And Moses is not very pleased, and he says, you know, should your countrymen go to war while you dwell here? Why do you dishearten B'nai Yisrael? Why are you bringing everybody down? Look, you know, as a congregation, we are mishpocha. We are family, and in all things, we stick together. We desire to stick together, and that stick to comes when we can congregate and get to know one another, for this is what Mishpocha is all about. These past few years where we have been beset by COVID and other things that have been going down, this should not be. We need to all cross the Jordan. We need to all come together. I'm not asking you to do something that is going to be riskful for your health, but the point is, as my dear friends, Reverend Alan, Deb Warner will always say, we are better together. And so we are grateful for the marvelous Mishpocha here at CBH. Ladies and gentlemen, if we could please rise for the Matovu prayer. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. As for me, through your great kindness, I will enter your house and bow down towards the sanctuary of your holiness in awe of you. O Lord, I love the shelter of your house and the place of the residence of your glory. I will prostrate myself and bow. I will kneel before the Lord, my maker. May my prayer to you, Hashem, be offered at a time that is favorable. O oh God, in the abundance of your kindness, answer us with the truth of your salvation. 
introduce Saul when he would give to us a midrash, and I've gotten away from that, but this morning I just feel that I need to do it. We so appreciate his insight, his preparation, and the marvelous golden nuggets that he gives to us each and every week. Saul, could you please come, my friend? Oh, please be seated. Please have a seat. Shabbat Shalom. Umer Barach. Favoritism tears at the fabric of human relationships, creating dissension and disunity. Yet when God himself has shown favoritism, it was with a greater purpose in mind. He did so to bring all men to himself. As such, the Holy One had chosen one man, Abraham, through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. And it was Abraham who begot the son of promise, Isaac. And from Jacob came the twelve tribes of Israel. Soon God would deliver the Hebrews from Pharaoh's cruel hand. For it was the Egyptians who were reared on lies, but there were those who saw through Israel's miracles that Adonai was mightier than the false idols of Egypt. And through Moses, God would bring the truth of his Ten Commandments and his Torah that in time would spread to the world. And it is the priests from the tribe of Levi who were to serve as examples to the rest of the tribes. For all of Israel was to become a nation of priests and become a witness of God's love to the world. And while Israel was in the wilderness, there were nations around them that marveled that a people could survive in the desert as they witnessed the powerful hand of God. And it was the temple of God in Jerusalem that was to serve as a beacon of light to the world. But when a fractured Israel constantly failed to represent Almighty God, it was Yeshua himself who became the beacon of truth to Israel and to the world. For the veil that separated Jew and Gentile was torn once for all when God fulfilled the great promise to Abraham of blessings to Jew and Gentile alike. So Adonai's favoritism had a purpose, but man's favoritism is self-serving. And it is he who provided healing from the pain of man's favoritism. Because of it, Isaac and Ishmael were united as brothers in bearing, a in bearing Abraham, even though it was Sarah who rejected Ishmael after Isaac was born. And it was God who brought about reconciliation between Jacob and Esau after much drama following Isaac and Rebekah's being at odds over their favorite sons. And it was the Holy One who stood at the entrance of Egypt to bring about the reconciliation of the brothers with Joseph, given Jacob's favoritism in order to forge the bonds of a fledgling nation. And it was Joseph as Pharaoh's right-hand man who broke the intergenerational sin of favoritism by forgiving his brothers. And he did so by not perpetuating pettiness or revenge that describes some of our patriarchs and matriarchs' actions. And so Joseph became a picture of our Messiah who forgave Israel while ascending to the right hand of the Father. For it is Yeshua who was disfavored among some in Israel. 
But yet he himself chose not to reject those who rejected him, but found a way to reconcile dying man, dying mankind by his sacrifice. And yet Israel had much to learn about favoritism, and perhaps it was God who allowed the people to learn what it was like to be disfavored. For there's another Pharaoh's absolute favoritism towards his own people that led Israel to be enslaved. And as such, the people would suffer much. But it is God who allowed their disfavor to teach them that favoritism ends in pain and disunity. Given the words of Micah, God wanted Israel to do justice, walk uprightly, and walk humbly with God. And it is in this, in this week's Pasha that we find Israel in one moment in time eschewing selfishness and walking in unity. For the tribes of Reuben and Gad had petitioned Moses to create homes on the eastern side of the Jordan, but they would not abandon their brethren. They would cross the Jordan to enter the land to fight with their fellow tribes before returning to their own homes. And so the people of Israel entered the promised land together, and they became for a time one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the favoritism of man brings anger, hurt, and rejection, but it is the favoritism of God in choosing Israel that have the purpose of bringing his healing touch to mankind. And because of it, there is one thing that unites us who are of the body of Messiah. For we, for we deliver to the world the good news of a Messiah who was unfavored and who died for those who had become unfavored so that all may be favored by God. Good morning. This past month, Jewish athletes went to Israel to participate in the Maccabeevia Games, also known as the Jewish Olympics, named after the Maccabean Revolt. 10,000 people came from 63 countries from all over the world to compete, to celebrate. Some came to connect with others and to connect with the land, the land where it was said, this is where we came from. Some are considering immigrating to Israel to return to live there. They stated, we love being here. I am reminded of the promise God gave to Abraham, that he, Abraham, would be a father of nations. And how exciting to see the fulfillment of this. Please pray with me. Father God, how grateful we are are that we can see the promise in the Torah came to fulfillment. You made the covenant with Abraham that he would be a father of nations. And we pray for all those Jewish people who came to Israel from all over the world. Lord, we pray that you will write your words on their hearts and minds, that you will be their God and they would know that they are your people. We pray you would continue to watch over your seed. This year, as they celebrate the victory of Hanukkah, Lord, may they be stirred by your spirit and come to know the one whose victory is eternal, Yeshua, the Messiah. We pray for your people, Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem. Father God, thank you for showing your faithfulness and loving kindness to them. Draw them gently home, physically and spiritually. so much for that beautiful and heartfelt prayer. We need to continually pray for the land. We need to continually pray for the people living in that land. God has great, great things 
in store for that land that it's going to bode well for every people, nation, kindred, and tongue. And as we pray for Israel, the calendar has turned, and yesterday began a new Hebrew month, the month of Av. Does the month of Av ring a bell in your collective memories? Uh, a week from today will be Tisha B'Av. It is a day of mourning and a day of fasting all throughout the Jewish world. But even with that aside, I want to encourage each of us to spend time in prayer, but not just prayer, but fasting as well. With so much taking place within our community, within this congregation, within Israel, within the world, that we need to accelerate and give a little kick to our prayer by having to accompany it with a time of fasting and just dwelling and relying on the mercies of the living God to come down and answer with great power through his authority. Could we please stand? May it be your will, O Lord our God, and God of our fathers, to renew for us this coming month for goodness and for blessing. May you grant us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of sustenance, a life of health, a life in which there is fear of heaven and fear of sin, a life free from shame and reproach, a life of abundance and honor, a life in which there will be in us the love of Torah and the fear of heaven, a life in which the Lord fulfills all the requests of our hearts for our good. Amen. O oh, Heavenly Father, the approach of another month reminds us of the flight of time and the change of seasons. Month follows month. The years of man's life are few and fleeting. Teach us to number our days that we may use each precious moment wisely. May no day pass without bringing us closer to you. Grant that the new month bring life and hope, joy and peace to all your children. And let us say, Amen. He who abides forever, exalted and holy is his name. And it is written, sing joyfully, you righteous, to the Lord. It is befitting for the upright to praise him. By the mouth of the upright you shall be lauded. By the words of the righteous you shall be blessed. By the tongue of the pious you shall be exalted. And in the midst of the holy, you shall be sanctified. Shochen od merom, v'kodoho shimaho, v'chatuv ranenu sadakim, v'adonai le'yasarim navati hila, v'hefei yasarim t'chalel, uv'divrei sadakim t'parach, Uvilshon Hasadim Tit Romaham Uve Kerev Kidoshim Tit Kadash. In the Shema prayer, <coughs> Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai. Boruch Shem Kevod Malachuto Leolam Vaed Veyachafta et Adonai Elohecha Vechol Levacha Uvechol Nafshecha Uvechol Meodecha Vechayu Hadvarim Ha'eler Asher Anochi Mitzavcha Hayom Al Levavecha 
vishinan tam livonecha, vidibarta bam bishiftecha, bivetecha, uv lechtecha va derech, uv shachbecha uv kumecha, uk shartam leot al yodecha, vichayu letotafot bain einecha, uchatav tam al mezuzot, betecha uvish ar recha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious majesty forever and ever. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your means. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. Teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them for a sign upon your hand and for frontlets between your eyes. Write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. You know, I do give, I, I do want to give, a, you know, at least, you know, what, what one shout out, uh, you know, Israel Morales is a long, long time friend, and we love this man. And this morning, he has the very special privilege, the treat, uh, and, and having his son John with him from Switzerland. So, John, look, we warmly welcome you. We love your dad, and we're thankful for the joy that comes when a father and son could spend time together. Okay, there are announcements to be made. I'm long-winded, so I ask someone who isn't long-winded to give these announcements. I can work on that. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Yes, there are a few things I wanted to bring to your attention this morning. Um, Next week, we have our business meeting, and you're all welcome, member or no, uh, and we'll, it's following the service in our social hall. And we will be having an oneg, so we're hoping that you will bring some food for us to eat. If you don't bring any food, there will be bagels and coffee. Um, but um, please plan to stay next week. It's our monthly oneg. Um, you know, uh, it's just a lovely time of fellowship with one another that we don't get to do too often anymore. So um, please stay um, next week. I also want to bring to your attention we're having our picnic August 14th. And <clears throat> there's a sign-up sheet in the social hall for your help. So we need people to help with the cooking and the setting up and the breaking down and the um, I don't know, you know, just tons of things. It's, uh, there's, it's all uh, put out there for you. Sign your name up. We, you know, this is a great time. We enjoy our time. It's, it's going to be here at Brith Shah. We've got a tent coming and bring your lawn chairs. We sit under the shade of those lovely trees, and uh, we enjoy one another's company. And Rabbi has a message for us. Uh, so um, please come. Please invite your, your neighbors and friends if you wish to do so. Uh, just make sure you bring a dish to share. We will bring the meats and um, uh, bring your lawn chairs and um, we'll provide the meat. Uh, another thing, um, Israel. So we got a great tour set up for uh, March for us to go on tour to Israel and we're looking for people to come along. I just wanted to mention that uh, should you need a roommate, a male or female re roommate, that's stopping you. Uh, we have a couple, uh, you can see me, some, I've had some people come up to me, and male, uh, I have a male and a female who are looking for a roommate, so um, don't let that stop you. And they're wonderful people, by the way, so don't be afraid of that. <laughs> um, Maureen, our lovely Maureen, she had um, an accident a couple, mm, I want to say like a month and a half or so ago, and it has affected her back. And so she's no longer able to do all the wonderful things that she's been doing for us these many years, including uh, some of the cleaning here at Bertha de Shah. She would come here. Um, so if that's something that you can help us out with twice a month or so, uh, you know, cleaning the library, dusting it, making sure the tables are cleaned off and everything's in place for Shabbat, maybe vacuuming of some rugs here and there, 
see me um, and um, we'll, I can set you up. Um, I think that that is it. Um, I can thank people for their faithfulness in giving. Uh, right now, we are uh, so um, awestruck by the many people that continue to support this uh, congregation, continue to support Rabbi and myself, <laughs> um, and this building, which uh, is uh, just a beautiful, beautiful gift of God, which um, this Sukkot, we celebrate 10 years in this building, so it, it's really wonderful. We have our Zadaka box in the back. Make sure you put your tithes in there. You can do that online um, through um, our website, or um, you can send it in the mail, the good old mail. So um, thank you so much, and we especially thank the Lord for his faithfulness. So, amen. Okay, thank you, Mark. And yeah, please remember to pray for Maureen for so many years. She's so faithful, so diligent, and really, really works hard. In the winter months when our hallways get all messed up through salt and mud or whatever else, you know, we drag in, she's so diligent to just clean it all up that when we come together on Shabbat that this synagogue is absolutely shining. We love her and we just pray for a supernatural touch of God upon her back. Now I've titled my talk this morning, A Song of Ascent. It's different than the Psalms of Ascent that we uh, read about that were composed by King David. This is a, a different Song of Ascent. The God of Israel, Israel, <laughs> the God of Israel is one of diversity. His creation reflects a vast array of diversity. The creative features that accentuate the beauty of our natural environment are diverse. The oceans, the lakes, the rivers, the streams and tributaries, the mountains, the forests, the deserts and the Arctic tundra. Now, even the foods that we eat are diverse in taste, nutrients, shapes, sizes, colors, not to mention that on any given day here in Western New York, we can choose to eat Chinese, Mexican, Indian, Italian, Polish, Middle Eastern, or even a good old American hot dog and hamburger. And ever since God scattered the human race at Babel, we come in a variety of colors, shapes, sizes, personalities, languages, and fingerprints. And, and hey, you know, I, I'm told that no two snowflakes are alike, but every time I try to examine it, it disappears before me. God loves diversity. He created it all this way. But diversity, along with inclusiveness, you know, these garner so much attention. The problem with the modern perception of diversity is that it purposely promotes division, deviancy, and disorder. It seeks to establish a forced conformity, things that run counter to God's creative order. And on a personal level, it encroaches freedom. It encroaches upon freedom of speech. For us who have come to know and love God through the miracles of a new birth experience, for us who understand the power of God to fulfill his word, ladies and gentlemen, we must never sing a song of ascent to the systems of this world. To ascent means to agree. It means to concur with a matter. It is equivalent to our saying, Amen, at the close of a prayer. And more often than not, we assent, we give, we give hearty an amen to injustices and evils by saying and doing nothing about it. In essence, silence is assent because our inaction in the face of injustice and oppression are akin to agreement. King David oftentimes was silent 
He could have reproved his sons, but he kept silent, and it just meant bad things for him and for his sons. But I want to call your attention to a single statement that just perked up something within me in Numbers chapter 30 and verses 13 and 14. And uh, unlike two weeks ago, I'm going to do it myself with the blessings. Can we please stand for the blessings over our Torah reading? For who had Adonai Hamavorach? For who had Adonai Hamavorach? For who had Eloheinu Melech Olam? Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Haomim, Vednatan Lanu et Porato, Poruchato Adonai, No Tain Hatorah, Amen. Her husband may ratify or veto any vow or sworn oath to deny herself. But if her husband says nothing to her from day to day, then he is confirming all her vows and all her oaths that are on her. He confirms them by saying nothing to her on the day of his hearing about it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam asher natan lanu Torah emet v'chaye olam nata betuchinu Baruch atah Adonai notein ha'Torah Amen. Please be seated. We just turn to some water, not the fountain of living water, but water. There we go. All right, now I'm ready to talk for an hour. You know, there is a rabbinic tradition about Jeremiah from Pasikta Rabbah. It's a commentary on Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is the that the weeping song when we were captives, you know, in Babylon. Uh, it's, a, it's a very sad song. But this is a commentary on, on the life of captivity. There is a rabbinic tradition about Jeremiah that provides an insight to this man's heart. When Jerusalem fell and the exiles were being led away, Jeremiah chose to be led away with them. When they got as far as the Euphrates River, the prophet decided it was better to return and offer comfort to those who remained behind. When the exiles saw that he was about to leave, they wept in a loud voice. Our father, Jeremiah, are you also abandoning us? He answered them, I call heaven and earth to witness. If you had shed a single tear when you were still in Zion, you would not have gone into exile. In other words, why shed a tear now when you should have responded properly when we were still in the land? You went along with the program. You consented in all of the treachery by your actions, and moreover, by your silence. My father of blessed memory didn't care much when my siblings and I would snitch or tattle on one another. If I approached him to say, Dad, Dave is playing with your cigarette lighter, this is the kind of answer I would get. And you let him? And you let him? So in other words, I was equally culpable by my inaction to stop Dave from playing with my father's cigarette lighter. And as it turns out, I used that cigarette lighter to burn the house down. But that's another story. But in another Talmudic teaching is this dictum from Yebamot 87a, 
silence is as good as agreement. The text is very clear that if a husband knows the nature of the vow his wife has sworn herself to, and he says nothing, he becomes a participant in her oath. If he delays in silence, her vow becomes irrevocably binding. So often silence is assent. How often have we heard a racist or demeaning slur and said nothing about it? We're communicating to the joke teller or whoever made that comment that, uh, you know, it's okay, you can keep saying those things. Or a dirty joke and you laughed. Now, I'm not a prude and I don't mind a good joke, but sometimes the joke crosses a fine line and it becomes distasteful. I don't want to assent to coarse jesting for which the Bible condemns. Ephesians 5, 4, and verse 11, obscene, coarse, and stupid talk are also out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Take no part in the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Are acts of injustice or callousness met with silence? Do we or someone we know personally, take advantage of the weak and the disabled, or the widow and the orphan, or the foreigner. See, there are countless scams out there that prey on the elderly. That's why they leave me alone. Things from home improvement to investments. And what of the, the, the treachery that takes place over phone or over the internet. If we see a wrong and remain silent, we assent to the misfortunes of others. In so many cases of abuse, the abuser continues to abuse, continues to terrorize, warning their victims, you better keep quiet about this. See, God has given to us so many laws and principles and the fact that he has to tell us in the form of commands is telltale evidence that we are an evil lot. For example, why does God have to tell us the following from Leviticus 19, 14? You are not to curse the deaf, deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am out and I. Now, why does God have to issue this command? Because of our fallen state. It doesn't come naturally. We take great sport. You know, if we put a stumbling block before someone who's blind or curse out somebody who's deaf. You know, to us, to the evil mind, it's just wrong that we take delight out of taking the advantage of other people. And all of this speaks of the timeless questions of when and how to get involved. What if during the Nazi era, the Christian communities of Europe didn't take a see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil approach? What if they did not turn a blind eye to the plight of their neighbors? The impropriety of turning a blind eye to evil makes us all an accomplice to the evil. Prior to his death, the courageous German churchman Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. To fortify the stranglehold of Germany's anti-Semitic laws, the death penalty was imposed on anyone protecting or giving aid to the Jewish people. Reverend Bonhoeffer could not assent to these evil mandates. He resisted these nefarious laws and was summarily hung for his act of bravery. Rabbi Judah Lowe, great 16th century chief rabbi of Prague, wrote the following, in the face of dangers befalling the Jewish community, while a person may be individually pious, such good will pale in the face of sin 
of not protesting against an emerging communal evil. Not only will such piety not avert the impending evil, but such a pious person will be accountable for having been able to prevent it and not doing so. This was written during a time period that was rightfully called the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages were dark because the fear of the Lord was cast aside for the fear of men. Tyrants arose and they oppressed the peoples. Churchmen abdicated their high calling to serve the state, and the faithful met with persecution and suffering. And through it all, the church expelled the Jewish people from one country to another. So now let me bring things home. Consider, cons consider the many deviant behaviors that have now been normalized and are becoming more and more deeply entrenched. Things that were once verboten, unthinkable, are now mainstream. Same-sex unions are the law of the land, and we are being pressured to celebrate this diversity. Two years ago in Somerville, Massachusetts, that city became the first city to extend official recognition to polyamorous relationships. It won't be long before blue states are going to come along and decide that limiting lust to just two people is bigotry. And thus, under the banner of inclusivity and diversity, this is going to gain some traction. Waiting for a vote right now in California, California Bill SB 107 would allow minors to receive puberty blockers and sex change surgery without parental consent. The, I mean, this is abhorrent, destroying the lives of children early on without parental consent. This is child abuse. And the fact that it's coming up for a vote is telltale evidence of where we are right now. See, we lose sight of what is going on around us, and we fail to see that the vice is getting tighter and tighter. President Biden's nominee for Supreme Court, Ketanji Brown Jackson, was asked a simple question by Senator Marsha Blackburn. Can you define, can you provide a definition for the wood word woman? Her response, no, I can't. I'm not a biologist. This is the woke world. Any first grader can answer that question. Now, the justice is not dense or dumb. She's just too radically woke. And furthering the lunacy, Vice Pre and I can give you a whole, a whole host of things, Vice President Kamala Harris, addressing a group of vision-impaired people, began her talk this way. I am Kamala Harris. My pronouns are are she and her. I am a woman sitting at the table wearing a blue suit. And on this, Dr. Michael Brown commented, my purpose is not to mock the vice president, rather it is to mock the cultural madness that set the stage for her comments. We must not become accustomed to this social insanity. You can't call a woman a woman, or he or a she. You know, they're birthing people. And even scarier is that we have a Secretary of Health and Human Services, Rachel Levine, who pretends to be a woman. And since 2012, she has lectured on how to perform sex changes on children and counsel parents to allow their children to decide what gender they are. Folks, this is worse than, than having Bernie Madoff heading up the U.S. Treasury. You know, in a rational, insane society, this is child abuse. Except for the brave and faithful few, there is a lack of outrage and pushback. And thus, we the people have essentially assented to all of this. 
How did we reach this point? It didn't just happen overnight. I submit to you that our biblical agenda is losing ground because the other side is certainly more motivated. They are more vocal while we have quietly assented for fear of being labeled as intolerant, closed-minded, and haters. Is this discussion politics or is it faith? It's both. The wonderful prophets that we read about in the scripture, why do we extol them? What made them so great? They came against the kings of Israel who were practicing idolatry. This is why they were great. See, the, the truth of the matter, they confronted evil. And folks, like the kings of the ancient world, we will not bow down to the gods of men. The modern-day Nebuchadnezzars have hoisted their images. The music is playing, but we will not bow down or assent to their idolatry. We are a faithful remnant in the earth that refuses to worship Baal. We refuse to follow the multitudes to do evil. We will not sing the sad song of ascent. Amidst the many pressures to conform and ascent, believers in every age have been tormented in spirit because on the one hand, our flesh craves acceptance and accolades, but on the other hand, to have this, one must pay a high price, compromising our core convictions. And in so doing, we live with a tormented conscience, knowing within ourselves that we have a divided allegiance. Listen to these words of the Messiah. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper so he may be with you forever. I just want to point out, we are never alone in our struggles. We have the Messiah, and the Messiah has sent the helper. John 14, 17, the Spirit, amen, let us, you know, Give thanks to the Lord. He has equipped us. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be with you. We need the spirit's empowerment. He is our helper. He is our comforter. This is our shield against the zany, crazy insanity that is outside these doors. From Sanhedrin 98b, the Talmud asks this question, what is the Messiah's name? Some say his name is Menachem. Menachem means comforter, since it is written, because Menachem, a comforter, relieves my soul. This is the Messiah, Menachem. Our, our, our comforter, our prince of peace. The spiritual darkness of this present age demands the spirit's empowerment along with the steady presence of our comforter. King David prophetically described the days that are upon us, really, the, the days that really encompass the totality of human history. The kings of the earth set themselves up and rulers conspire together against Adonai and against his anointed one. Who are the kings of this earth conspiring against? Conspiring against God himself and on his anointed one, the Messiah Yeshua. Let's rip their chains apart and throw their ropes off us. <laughs> he who sits in the heavens laughs. Adonai mocks them. We 
we're in the midst of a dark age when people and nations are casting off God's restraints, continually rejecting anything to do with him. There is an ever-increasing, escalating showdown in the making. From the beginning of time, where the kingdoms of this earth have taken aim against the kingdom of the living God. And in the context of Numbers 30, in the previous chapters, the enemies of Israel, the Midianites, knew that they could not defeat Israel militarily because God had covenanted with her. And so what did they do? They hired Balaam to curse Israel. But you can't curse what God blessed. And finally, Balaam found a way to defeat Israel by seducing her to sin against God. And thus God would lift his protection. Balaam devised a scheme for the Midianites to dispatch their daughters to lure Israel's men into sinning against the Lord, and it worked. He implemented Satan's kryptonite and brought down the supernation that was blessed of God. In the midst of this age, you know, we, those who know the Lord and have found forgiveness and we have tasted atonement, we are to be a soul and light. As a covenant people, we represent his light despite the powerful forces of wickedness that are mustered in opposition. We have an eternal calling to sanctify the name of the Lord by healing the sick, by pursuing peace with all men, defending the weak, and rescuing those who are being led to the slaughter. By performing acts of loving kindness and charity, acts of tikkun olam, we move from silence to eloquence. We are his hands and his voice. And this is the real song of ascent that we must sing. We concur and we assent to all of God's purposes. And lastly, prior to God's creation, the world was described as formless, void, empty darkness. The darkness prevailed and it remained so because of silence. As for how long the earth was desolate and dark and silent, it's all purely speculative. But there is one thing that I know for sure is that the darkness and the void remained up to that very time when the silence was broken by the powerful voice of God. And we need the powerful voice of God to break through the darkness and the silence of this hour. Let's be extremists. <laughs> when the Holy One of Israel lifted his voice and broke the silence, he did so with these words. You know those words. Let there be light. And whenever God speaks, darkness loses its power and light prevails. The voice of the Lord heralded in the start of creation and beginning of God's dealings with mankind. The voice of the Lord can also herald the start of an individual becoming as a new creation as we ascent to receiving the light of God. At the temple in Jerusalem, at the very height of the festival of Sukkot, Messiah Yeshua proclaimed, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Rabbi Shaul would write too, therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let us no longer be wavering between two opinions. We get the other side of the opinions, and we are bombarded with these things day in and day out. 
You can't even watch sports without this stuff being thrown in your face. It used to be my, my, uh, my, my place of release. When, when the craziness of the world, I can flock in and, and take part in sports, but you can't even escape it when in sports. But you feel a bit squeezed, wanting to side with God, but yet also wanting, not wanting to go against the, 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 the grain and the flow of society. Is there sin that you're keeping silent about? Have you confessed to him your struggles with being bitter and unforgiving? Have you come clean before him with regards to various life-dominating addictions and sexual sins? See, God desires for us to walk in the light. There was a time in our lives when we all walked in darkness. And our wisdom was in the things that we believed in the foolishness of our mind. And lo and behold, we investigated the claims of Yeshua. And in our own way, God was leading us on. And on the day when we recognized he was the Messiah, that darkness was replaced by light, and the inner turmoils began. (laughs) They're all carefully spoken about in Romans chapters 7 and verse 8. But we need God's light. We need his helper. We need his comforter to keep us in a path that will avoid us from having dual and divided allegiances. And lastly, I just want to Close with this from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, Adonai's hand is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Rather, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Messiah has broken that separation. Whatever gap that there was, whatever is keeping us away from walking in union with the Lord in Messiah, that is all the thing of the past. If we will just come to him with a humble prayer of teshuva, a humble prayer of repentance. Look, every day, you know, we need to be energized. We need to be encouraged by the words of God. You know, sometimes I'm guilt, too guilty of reading news stories than I am of the scripture. When I read just news stories, I get bummed out. <laughs> when I read the scripture first, I get encouraged. When I read the scripture first, it enables me to deal and not to assent with the news stories to get me bummed out. But we need him We need his helper, and may we find strength in the equipping that God has given to us. May we acknowledge the Messiah in our hearts and believe for him to improve on the new creation that he has established. Lord God, you have arrested our hearts, and through your Spirit's working, You have gained our attention. You have opened up our eyes. You have opened up our ability to hear. Oh, God, we just pray against any obstacle to our sight. We pray against any obstacle that causes for there to be a break in hearing your still small voice. We turn all matters over to you. We pray, oh, Lord, that our song of ascent will be the kind of song of ascent that David and so many of the faithful would make as they ascended Zion's holy hill to worship you, the Lord of hosts, before your temple in Jerusalem. This is the song of ascent that needs to come from our lips and from our heart. We lift our voices up to you. We lift our hearts up to you. Lord, make us whole through the powerful healing touch 
of your ruach on our lives. Let us not conform to the world around us, but enable us to demonstrate love, caring to all of those who are still caught up within the tight, the tight vices of this world and its systems. Lord, may we be your emissaries, bringing hope, bringing an alternative, bringing the salvation that we discovered in a time previous. We leave these things into your watchful care and ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. You know, there is so much, so much going on. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the opposition is very loud. They're very vocal. They are very <clears throat> militant. And I'm not asking us to be militant. If we're going to be militant, let it be through the place of prayer. Imprecatory prayer against the powers of darkness, not individuals. The individuals are controlled by the powers of darkness. But we cannot remain silent. You know, some of the things that you, you, you learn as you go through life is that for changes to take place, it goes through a political process. And my experience is when the political process plays itself out, those who have to cast deciding votes one way or another, some, you know, are governed by a conscience are governed by God, you know, and a conscience of the heart. But I would submit to you that the greater majority, what they watch more than anything, are polls. They're poll-driven. They'll lick their finger, put it up in the air, and see which way the wind is blowing, and that's how they're going to calm down. You know, we could create a little wind. How many have signed petitions? How many have written letters? We cannot remain silent. I'm glad Rabbi Shaul did not remain silent. I'm glad Elijah and Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and all of our great prophets, I'm glad that they didn't keep silent. Were they loved by the people at that time? Nah, <laughs> not at all. They were not loved. But as time grew on, today, you know, we respect and we love them. We don't abide by the words, but we're thankful for their message, right? It's a new day, folks. It's a new day. Let us walk with the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Amen. Oh, Lord. Could we please stand? Ivarecha ho Adonai vayish marecha. Yair Adonai penevu lecha vichunecha. Yisei Adonai penevu lecha v'yaseim lecha shalom. Adonai bless you and keep you. I don't know, I make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I don't know, I turn his face toward you and grant you shalom. May we live, move, and act in the peace of God, and may he, the Messiah, and his helper, the indwelling of his ruach, those fountains of living water, may they ever be our guiding light. Amen and amen. Let us enjoy a restful Shabbat Shalom as we move in his peace. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shabbat Shabbat.